Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. This is a podcast after all. You choose the place, time, or platform you choose to listen in on. Welcome into the Slump Buster Week 2 recording here on Thursday, August 8, 2019. Find us on the Spotify app, Google Play Store, iTunes, or our YouTube channel. We really appreciate your support. This week, we're going to continue our discussion on the NFL divisional breakdowns, with the AFC, NFC East pictures being the topic of today. Also included in this podcast, we're going to be delving into some of the headlines out of the National Basketball Association. This week, we had an interesting interview between Carmel Anthony and Stephen A. Smith on First Take, and they've also released the schedule for the opening night, the Christmas schedule, and some of our international games. Welcome in, Andre. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you, Julian? I'm doing fantastic. So, starting first with the NBA schedule, the Christmas night games, the opening night games, what are some of your thoughts looking off of the list? Yeah, so, I mean, I guess if we run through the list real quick, right, some of the prominent ones that we see, uh, Los Angeles Lakers versus Clippers, New Orleans Pelicans, right, you get the Zion Wow Factor versus Denver, Boston, Toronto in the East, also Milwaukee, Philly, and then Houston Golden State Warriors. So, so overall, I want to say, I think there's definitely some exciting games, right? Especially when it comes to the Lakers and Clippers are some, some are the matchups I'm most excited for. One, because I'm a Lakers fan, right? So I'm excited to see this new look team. It actually seems like the Lakers will be good for uh, the first time in about a decade, right? Where they actually have a legitimate shot at at making the playoffs. But the the other reason, though, is one, Kawhi Leonard and Paul George both spurn, you know, the Lakers a little bit, right? So, of course, there's the whole tampering thing with Magic Johnson trying to get Paul George over. He said he was coming. Hey, just wait the year for me, right? You don't need to trade for me now. What happens? They waited. He doesn't even take the meeting, right? And then Kawhi, they ended up waiting, you know, this season, obviously, this offseason, I should say, for him and free agency, thinking, oh, we're going to build a dynasty, right? It's going to be easy wins, some more championships, uh, possibly enough championships to overtake the Boston Celtics, right? And what ends up happening, though, is Kawhi goes to the Clippers and takes Paul George with them. So I I think it's going to be a really interesting matchup. I think this may be the first time in a while where we get an actual good Lakers and Clippers rivalry, right? So every time that the Lakers have been good, Clippers have been bad. And ever since the Clippers have been good, Lakers have been bad. But now there's actually going to be a really good rivalry. And it actually means something, right? Like I think both teams have a decent shot at making it to the NBA finals as well. So, Yeah, definitely. When you look at the Lakers and Clippers this year, it seems as though you're looking at the top one and two seeds in the Western Conference. A lot can change. I mean, the West is going to be still very competitive. I'm not going to write the Warriors off completely yet. I think that the Rockets are going to be a dangerous team out there as well. And then you also have the more don't really have superstar yet kind of teams like Utah and the Nuggets who are ready to take that next step. Yeah. I even like the Lakers a little bit as well to come out of there. But as far as the um, going back to focusing on the main schedule. So it, one of the big things that stood out to me is the NBA is really wasting no time in unwrapping their shiny new toy in Zion Williamson. They have them both feature prominently against the reigning champs on opening night there in Toronto and then they're going to also have him on Christmas versus the Nuggets. It's kind of interesting to see like a rookie get such prominent headlines. I know the Pelicans are kind of an interesting little squad. And when we start talking more into predictions for what's going to happen this year, I even kind of see them potentially being a 7-8 seed in the Western Conference and sneaking in because I like some of their pieces on that roster. I think they have a good coach. So a lot can happen. Um, the only thing is I feel like the NBA – could also potentially be setting themselves up for failure having Zion on that Christmas Day schedule. What if things don't quite work out? Um, What if he's not what we picture? I mean, he's still young, so people are going to give him the benefit of doubt that he'll figure it out. But a lot of juice could get lost in that matchup between now and Christmas Day. Yeah, definitely. I mean, so the opening night, I think the expectations might be a little bit lower. I know Toronto is a little bit weaker, right? So they waited out all of free agency for Kawhi, didn't get him. Uh, So Toronto is going to take a step backwards than what they were. Uh, But especially with the Christmas Day one, right? So he's going to be going up against Jokic. Denver may possibly get Michael Porter Jr. back if he's healthy. I know he's been very injury prone, but what I've heard when he's healthy, he's very good. And honestly, Denver is my sleeper pick in the West. So even though I'm a Lakers fan, 
I honestly think Denver's the squad that can possibly beat both the Lakers and the Clippers, right? Especially if you look at not necessarily their first and second guys where the Lakers might be better, right? But once you start getting to the third, fourth, fifth guy on the roster, I think Denver's much better than the Lakers and even the Clippers. Yeah, but the main kind of concern I have, particularly with the NBA when it comes to like eyeballs on that game not a lot of people are going to be tuning in for Denver. They're going to be tuning in for Zion. For Zion. And yeah, if Zion yeah. is a disappointment by that time in the season, it's going to be interesting kind of like see what the ratings are. I mean, hey, he can live up to expectations, and that game could be huge. But it could also be a huge dud if the Pelicans are struggling and the Nuggets just don't command the kind of attention that the NBA wants on their Christmas schedule. Yeah, well, I mean, not so not only is Denver tough, right? So that's that's exactly why I pointed that out. But the other issue being that the Pelicans are an interesting squad, but they're still a young squad, right? So yeah. you, you do have Kyle Korver, you, you do have Holiday, right, who are your veterans. But when you think about it, you have Lonzo Ball, who I thought for the most part was still kind of unproven with the Lakers. Uh, he did everything really well except for shoot, right? And a lot of people have issues with that. He also had an issue with staying healthy. Same thing with Brandon Ingram, uh, even Josh Hart, right? Had some tendonitis, I think, in his knees and ankles. So you have a lot of young pieces that I think the Pelicans are going to be relying on that if they're not playing very well, um, how does that impact Zion's success and Zion's season, right? And so all of it could be a recipe for um, a fun, exciting team, but it, it can also easily go bad. Yeah, absolutely. And then, too, you kind of touched on the Raptors a little bit. The Raptors winning, Kawhi departing, kind of also put the NBA in kind of a weird spot for this year as well. So it's just tradition that the reigning champs gets an opening night game. Unfortunately, um, now you're really going to have to depend on Pascal Siakam mm-hmm. and Lowry to be able to bring attention to that game. And uh, obviously, they don't have the same national pill. They don't have that star power in that matchup. Even like their Christmas Day matchup against my Celtics, I'm not the most thrilled to see that game, to be honest. I would have much rather saw on Christmas Day the Celtics versus the Nets. I think both tying in Kyrie's return to Boston along with the Christmas holiday would have been huge, especially since the Nets are absent altogether from the Christmas Day schedule, which is unique. I know they don't have Durant this year, and they're relying purely on Kyrie to carry their team, but I still feel that Kyrie has enough star power to command a prominent spot on Christmas Day. Yeah, so I agree with that. I think the the problem with Toronto, so Toronto is still going to be very good. They're still long. They still play very good defense. Um, they'll be a tough team, but you're right. Like, they don't have very much star power behind that. Like, all their players are very good players, don't get me wrong, right? Like, even Van Fleet ended up coming a little bit into his own towards the end, right? Like, Steph Curry was switching off of him in games, but – none of those names really have that star power like you're saying even Kyle Lowry I think we saw that he wasn't necessarily the best guard like he he was pretty good towards the end of the series but I think he had fouled out the first two or three games so you're right Toronto doesn't have all of that uh, sort of pizzazz that comes with them whereas if you do have a Brooklyn right especially if they're playing Boston it's sort of you get that revenge match and you get the exciting hey what's Brooklyn you know 2.0 2.0 going to look like versus the Boston Celtics that, you know, he sort of got the bad rap for, right? Like a lot of times Kyrie was like blamed, I think, for why Boston had struggled a little bit, which in some ways I thought was unfair, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I thought there, there were a lot of, uh, I guess there was a lot of blame that could have gone around for Boston's season last year. But I do think it makes for a better storyline. And you're right. I do wish it, it would have been the Christmas Day matchup. We'll, we'll get to see Kyrie versus Boston, but yeah. it would have been better, yeah, on Christmas Day. Even just having Kyrie on the slate altogether, having that new Brooklyn squad on the Christmas Day schedule just made more sense to me. I would even, wouldn't even have minded if they put him against the Knicks. And I don't love the idea of seeing the Knicks squad on Christmas Day. However, I do think that that prominent New York, New York matchup added with the added feel that I'm sure Kyrie's going to receive as much booze as he's going to receive in Boston as he would in Madison Square Garden. You know, those Knicks fans are going to be a little bit agitated after this offseason they just had. Oh, yeah. And, and I mean, to be honest, I think the Knicks, 
did a decent job, right? So everybody gives them a lot of crap because they struck out on all the big free agents, which is why they cleared the cap space, right? So they got rid of Christoph Porzingis, had, you know, spot for two max free agents and didn't get anybody. That being said, their team is not awful, right? Like they're definitely probably not going to win the East. They're not going to compete for a title, but could I see them making the playoffs in the East? Absolutely. And so, like you said, the added you know, sort of East Coast, that New York versus New Jersey-ish um, sort of rivalry. And I think it would have made for a really good, fun matchup. The environment, it would have packed Madison Square Garden. Uh, the crowd would have been really into it. It would have been a fun game. Also on Christmas Day, though, in addition to seeing a potential Western Conference finals matchup between the Lakers and Clippers, you do have a great matchup there between the Bucks and 76ers. I think most people would say that that's who they project in the Eastern Conference Finals this year, those two squads. Yeah, and, and I think the Al Horford element, right, going up against Giannis Antetokounmpo now makes things really interesting, right? So Joel Embiid is extremely hard to defend. He's going he's gonna to put up some points for him. Uh, but the Al Horford defense, being able to possibly stop Giannis, that's what I'm looking for really looking at yeah you know um it does seem like that's going to be a very compelling matchup to watch um especially after last year seeing if Giannis could take some more steps as a shooter I mean you can obviously say the same thing about the 76ers squad when when it comes to Ben Simmons I've been seeing some videos lately that he's at least trying it um which is encouraging but we'll see if you're already three years into the league and still haven't developed a jumper it's cause for concern Going away from kind of like breaking down those teams for the time being. Also, you do have scheduled in there the Westbrook Westbrook returns to OKC. So as much as we said that Tyree is going to receive his booze when he goes back to Boston Gardens, I think Westbrook is going to get showered with praise. So that's going to be nice to see. Mm -hmm. Um, That's going to take place in early January. We do have also as well the international games mentioned. So... It looks like Mexico City is going to get some love here in December. On the 12th and 14th, respectively, you do have the Mavs and Pistons going down there, and then you do have the Spurs and the Suns. It's kind of interesting to see the NBA reach out to Mexico. There hasn't been a lot of Mexican star power in the NBA over its existence, Um, so the outreach there is going to be kind of a new effort, I assume, to kind of brand outward towards them. And hopefully by the time the next generation hits, we'll see some talent come out of Mexico. Geographically, the Spurs and the Suns make sense to me. The Mavs and Pistons is a little bit more of a reach. And then, too, when we look at the other international slates, so the NBA is also going to go to Paris this year. They're going to be sending the Hornets versus the Bucks over there. Obviously, the Bucks, that's going to be exciting. Giannis, uh, obviously a big European star, so he's going to draw the crowds over there however uh, obviously you kind of wish they would have scheduled a better opponent the Hornets at this point losing Kemba Walker don't have any juice to bring to that matchup you think Michael Jordan goes over there <laughs> <laughs> I mean maybe right just to, just to have a vacation in Europe or something like that I yeah so I think you're right so I don't know what the fan base will be like in Mexico I'm glad they're trying it and I think it's definitely a good year for the NBA to try it. It's probably their most exciting year there's been in a while, just because the team race is so open, right? So in the past, it's been just Golden State or just the Miami Heat or just the Cavs, right? Yeah. Um, but this year, it can literally be any team, right? So if you, if you can get maybe a new audience like Mexico City and Mexico in general hook, I think this is the year to do it just because everything can change next year, right? With Kevin Durant coming back and you'll have Clay Thompson coming back. Uh, you'll get some of those new guys, right? Zion will develop a little bit. Uh, so I, I do think it's a good year to branch out. Don't know how successful it will be. The French, the France game, I definitely think there's potential there. Not in this game itself. Uh, I think you're right. The Hornets are not the most uh, compelling uh, opponent for uh, for the Bucks. I, I sort of wish they would have put another European star out there. Like a Kristaps yeah. Porzinka, Porzinka. Yeah, honestly, I was just about to say that. If they would have put the Mavs versus the Bucks, like not only do you have Kristaps in that matchup, but you also have Luka as well. Yeah, and Giannis. So you have a lot of your European stars that I think people would have liked. The other thing, too, is I would almost say the Spurs would have been better out in, out in France, too, just because you have that tie to, like, Tony Parker, right? And he'd always play on the French team when he played international ball. So I thought – 
I thought there, honestly, even Rudy Gobert with the Utah Jazz might have been a little bit better than the Hornets. But, hey, I think it's a geography thing, honestly, in time zones. Yeah, there's that. Um, I think, too, uh, the NBA was maybe being a little stingy on sending which stars they wanted to send on international travel at this with these games. You know, like, if the NBA really wanted to make waves, obviously they would have sent, like, a Lakers, Clippers squad. However, you know, these, these teams can work. There is some interesting squads in here. We do think the Mavs are going to be a more competitive squad. The Pistons, they do have Blake Griffin and some star power over there. When it comes to the Spurs, I mean, you know, fundamental basketball. <laughs> They're going to be what they are with Pop. The Suns, obviously. Are stuck in permanent rebuild. <laughs> They're in, like, purgatory for NBA teams, I guess. But. Yeah, and I don't even know what we're going to get out of the Hornets this year. Um, probably top three lottery right there. Yeah. 